Going on to our next presentation, Dr. Jug Doug Jacobstein is a pediatric gastroenterologist and vice president of clinical development at Prevention Bio in Baltimore, Maryland. In his current role, he serves as the clinical lead for prevention's phase 2B clinical trial in non-responsive celiac disease. Over the last 12 years in the pharmaceutical industry, he has served in a variety of positions in research and development and medical affairs, including previous experience at Alba Therapeutics working on celiac disease. Prior to joining Prevention Bio earlier this year, Doug was in clinical development at Janssen R&D focused on therapeutics for inflammatory bowel disease. Doug graduated from the University of Maryland School of Medicine, completed his pediatric residency at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children, and completed his fellowship in pediatric gastroenterology and hepatology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Doug, it's over, over to you. Fantastic. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the CCA for including me uh, in this exciting day of presentations. Um, for the next bit of time, I'm going to take the opportunity to discuss uh, developments of medications for celiac disease. We'll focus a little bit on some background about why uh, medications, uh, development of medications in celiac disease is important. Um, and provide some background about what patients think about the, the role of medications in celiac disease should be. We'll shift gears a little bit and focus on a little bit of the pathophysiology of celiac disease, and then use that as a backbone to show where uh, within the pathogenesis of the disease that companies are working on potential therapies uh, to alleviate the signs, symptoms, and inflammation components of celiac disease. And then we'll shift gears to the last bit of the talk and talk about uh, the company that I currently work for, Prevention Bio, and the work that we're doing um, in the development of therapeutics for celiac disease, and, and finish up with our plans for a phase 2B study that will start later this year. So just a couple of disclosures. As Mark mentioned, I am the Vice President of Clinical Development for Prevention Bio currently. As it relates to celiac disease, I also in the past have worked um, in clinical development at Alba Therapeutics, and so have some background in this area. Doug, can I just cut in? Um, we only, we're seeing your, uh, present, your presenter screen, so we see the next slide. Can you just change your, oh, your presentation yep. so we can just see the full slide so we can get the full view? Uh, Thanks. Uh, yep, apologies about that. No. Sorry about that, I can't see the screen, so. No problem. How's that? There you Sorry go. about that. Perfect. Thanks. Apologies. Thanks for pointing that out, Melissa. I appreciate it. So to, to, to set the stage for, um, for the development of therapeutics, I think it's important to review why we think it's important to develop therapeutic for celiac disease. As, as other speakers have said today, currently there are no approved non-dietary treatments for celiac disease. So currently, the only therapy that's available is the gluten-free diet. We know that the gluten-free diet can be effective, but there is a high degree of patient dissatisfaction um, that relates to the diet. It's inconvenient in a lot of ways. Um, it affects uh, interactions in social settings, and gluten-free foods are expensive and add to the burden of, gluten, of the gluten-free diet. In addition to attempts at doing the gluten-free diet, we know that despite best efforts, that as little as 50 milligrams of gluten a day can trigger inflammation and symptoms associated with celiac disease. There's a nice study that was done in, in the early 2000s that looked at exposure to gluten and how much uh, gluten exposure was needed to, to develop inflammation. And that study showed that as little as 50 milligrams a day can lead to inflammation within the GI tract. And then finally, and I think this is, is relevant for a lot of the patients that are on the call today, is that gluten contamination oftentimes leads to signs and symptoms even though best efforts are made to, uh, to adhere to a gluten-free diet. We know that about 30 to 50% of patients who have celiac disease and remain on a gluten-free diet continue to have symptoms despite their best efforts. These patients are oftentimes referred to as non-responsive celiac disease patients, and oftentimes is the focus of uh, drug development uh, to, to, to target these patients who continue to have symptoms despite their best efforts. So as I mentioned, the, the treatment burden associated with celiac disease, even though there's no medications, the treatment burden is, is incredibly high. This was a study that was done by um, Dan Leffler and his colleagues um, at uh, Beth Israel in, in Boston, looking at how um, the perceived treatment burden affected patients. They used a visual analog scale 
and patients rated from zero to 100 how difficult it was to, to maintain uh, the, the gluten-free diet as compared to, uh, to other uh, treatments associated with other conditions. And what you see here on this slide is, is that celiac disease rates very high in terms of the per perceived treatment burden. So over here on the left, which shows celiac disease, it is the second highest in terms of treatment burden, only uh, second to end-stage renal disease in terms of the treatment burden um, among patients with the disease. And so you can see here that, that again, that patients um, uh, really are, are, are struggling on the diet um, and that, that the, tr the treatment burden is high. The next study I wanna focus on is, is a study that looked at whether patients who have celiac disease are interested in, in a drug to prevent symptoms and effects of the gluten contamination. So this was a study that was done in Chicago. Um, it looked uh, at approximately 260 patients they sent, they sent surveys to. They got responses in 182 patients and reported out the findings among patients who were on a, a, a gluten-free diet and had celiac disease, whether they would be interested in, in a drug to prevent um, signs and symptoms of celiac disease. What this slide shows is in both groups, so whether it was uh, patients who wanted a drug that would, would help uh, uh, as an adjunct to a gluten-free diet, so would, would prevent signs, symptoms, and inflammation associated with cross-contamination, or patients who could go out and consume as much gluten as they wanted, so replacement of a gluten-free diet, I think what you can uh, deduct from this slide is that, that patients with celiac disease are definitely interested in therapies in addition to the gluten-free diet. I do want to focus, and what I found interesting about this study was that not only are they interested in, in, um, in the development of therapies for celiac disease, but, but patients actually were more interested in a drug that allowed uh, as an adjunct to gluten-free diet rather than the replacement of a gluten-free diet. So it's not uh, so much that they want to be able to, to go out and consume as much gluten as, as they can. It's that they'd like to feel the, the, the comfort and confidence of knowing that if there is inadvertent cross-contamination, that they are protected. And this what de depicted in this slide here. So I think it's important as we, as we focus on, on therapies for celiac disease, it's important to understand how drugs get developed. And uh, without using too much reference, I know that because of COVID-19 that there's no hockey in, in the Northland there, um, but without focusing too much on it, I, I do think it's important to, to, to mention that we need multiple shots on goal. And the reason we need multiple shots on goal is that in the development process for drugs, most medicines will fail to be approved. And it's also likely that we may need combinations of therapies to treat certain conditions. And so this slide is a representation of how drugs get developed uh, in, in the marketplace. And so what you can see here is, is that from drug, drug discovery, which is on the left side of the screen here, you start with, it with, with thousands of compounds out there that, that may show, uh, potentially show benefit, and that's at the cellular level. Those drugs get pared down over a course of time to, to what enters the preclinical phase. The preclinical phase is oftentimes where they would test the therapy in, in models of disease in animals. And so that, that gets whittled down from about five to 10,000 compounds to approximately 250 compounds that they may test in the preclinical phases. Once that happens and some are identified that may work in, in a model of, of disease in animals, those are then taken into uh, what we call phase one clinical trials. And in a phase one clinical trial, oftentimes those are tested in healthy volunteers. You can see along the bottom of the slide here, the numbers of patients that those, those drugs may be tested in. And so when you enter a phase one clinical trial, you, you uh, look for healthy volunteers who want to participate in, in clinical studies. And you look at the safety of that drug and how that drug may be metabolized by the body uh, to see whether it's a safe product to use and to, to, to move towards further development. Once the drug is used in a phase one trial and it's found to be safe, you can then shift into uh, a phase two trial. And typically there are two pieces of a phase two trial. There's what's called a phase two A trial, where you're testing it in the disease state that you're interested in. In our case, it would be celiac disease. And it may be a little smaller trial to, to, to demonstrate what we call proof of efficacy. So does the drug work in the disease population that we want to, to use it in? If it shows some efficacy, uh, 
the drug company will then move into what's called a phase 2B trial, which moves into dose finding. So what you're trying to do is you're looking at that affected population with the disease. And then you're looking at finding different doses and how those different doses act on the disease. Oftentimes in the phase 2B program and, and in the 2A program for that matter, you'll use what's called a placebo, which is an inactive substance to compare that drug to an inactive substance to see how it performs. In the event that, that the drug continues to show um, efficacy in those 2B trials, and uh, you can demonstrate that the drug is safe, then move into phase three, which is the, the, the phase that, that demonstrates efficacy in a large population and just before approval. And so oftentimes you'll move, and you can see again on the bottom of the slide, the numbers of volunteers that are required. Oftentimes in a phase three program, you'll have thousands of volunteers who are testing that drug to make sure that it's not only safe, but that it performs well in large, well-controlled trials. If the drug moves, uh, demonstrates efficacy, you move from the phase three into a, an FDA submission for filing, and that can take a, a year to two years uh, for approval of the drug and then out to, to marketing into the community. And so using this model is what, what pharmaceutical companies will use in terms of the development of therapeutics. And so as we think about developing therapies for celiac disease, this is the model that we would use. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the goal here really is to, 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 to focus on uh, therapeutic pathways within celiac disease that may serve for the development of therapies. And this slide, I'm just going to review briefly. We've had some discussion on this in, in earlier talks, but what I want to do is just briefly review what we understand for the pathogenesis of celiac disease. So why do patients uh, who are at genetic risk develop celiac disease? Well, the first step is that in, pre, in genetically predisposed uh, uh, patients, who ingest uh, gluten peptides, those gluten peptides are then broken down into, into gliadin, which crosses the epithelial barrier of the GI tract and into uh, the, the subepithelial lamina propria. Within, that, in, within the GI tract, these gluten peptides interact with an enzyme called transglutaminase. Transglutaminase in the body serves a couple purposes. It deambidates uh, gluten peptides it basically breaks it down into smaller uh, gluten peptides, and those peptides are then picked up by cells that are called antigen-presenting cells, which is seen here. Now, in order for the, the, these antigen-presenting cells to, to pick up the, the gliadin, they need to have particular HLA class. And I think in, a, in the previous talk, we talked a little bit about HLA DQ2 or DQ8. Those are the, the uh, HLA classes that would make you at risk for celiac disease. So in those patients that have HLA DQ2 or DQ8, they pick up these gluten peptides and present them to uh, CD4 T cells. These CD4 T cells react with these antigen presenting cells and do a couple different things. One is that they stimulate uh, components within the innate immunity to lead to inflammation in the recruitment of lymphocytes within the lining of the, uh, the intestinal tract to cause inflammation. Additionally, these T cells interact with uh, B cells, which produce antibodies, and in particular autoantibodies, to uh, tissue transglutaminase that can lead to extraintestinal complications for celiac disease. And so each of these steps in the pathway are potential mechanisms by which we can develop therapies to attack uh, uh, the, the uh, pathophysiology, the pathogenesis of celiac disease. So I put this slide in the deck not to focus on the drugs that are here in green, but to demonstrate that the changes that have occurred over the last 10 years in the development of therapies. This slide, if you recall, the last slide I showed, which is similar to this slide, demonstrates that in 2010, there were very few uh, potential therapies that were being investigated for celiac disease. And so you can see here on the right that in 2010, there were only about uh, five therapies that were being tested um, for uh, potentially for their role in, in, um, in celiac disease. And what I'd like to show now is to shift gears and show you in 2020, the number of therapies that potentially are being tested for celiac disease. And in this slide, what I want to focus on are the different categories of drugs 
that are out there that are being considered. So the first step would be to think about whether we could act on the gluten peptides within the intestinal tract and prevent those harmful peptides from crossing over. And we would do that by using endopeptidases or glutenases, which may break down dietary gluten peptides into smaller, uh, much smaller uh, proteins that would not then act with, with uh, tissue transglutaminase to lead to the harmful effects. So that's one category of therapies um, that, that are available. Additionally, within the, 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 the lumen of the intestinal tract, there are also uh, pre-treated or gluten binders, which may grab onto uh, dietary pepti gluten peptides and not allow them to, to cross over that barrier. The next category to focus on would be agents that uh, reduce the permeability or the ability for dietary peptides to cross the, uh, the intestinal tract and get into the submucosa. And so one therapy that's out there is a drug called lorazotide acetate that's being developed by a company called Nine Meters that is attempting to pull these cells back together. So if you look at this slide right here, at this area right here, you see that there's a big gap between these cells, which are called tight junctions. The goal would be to, to reduce that distance and bring these cells back together to not allow these dietary peptides to cross over. An additional category of therapies that, that are being worked on are what we call transglutaminase 2 inhibitors. So these would work on the enzymes that I talked about before, the tissue transglutaminases that deamidate uh, gliadin and would prevent that, the ability of gliadin to be deamidated, leading it to it not forming uh, uh, links with antigen presenting cells here that would stimulate the immune system. And so again, the goal here would be to block that enzyme uh, from, from its ability to, to, uh, to break down gliadin. An additional category of drugs that, that people are working on are, are what are called tolerance induction. So this is, in, in, in simple terms, is thinking about like what allergy shots would do. So you would give small doses of, of, uh, of uh, gliadin or gluten to uh, patients who have um, celiac disease with a goal to stimulate the immune system in a proper way to prevent the sequelae from celiac disease. So this would be tolerance inducing. Uh, the, there's a company out there called Core, uh, which has uh, partnered with Takeda um, to, to, uh, to provide patients with, uh, with tolerating, uh, tolerating uh, uh, proteins to see if they can stimulate the immune system in the right way. And then the final category that I wanna focus on, which is the category of, of drugs that, that prevention focuses on, are, are uh, uh, proteins that block the ability of the immune system uh, to, uh, to perform in the right way. So in, in this slide here, we depicted lymphocyte blocking and the specific drug that we work on is, is a product called, uh, is an anti-IL-15. So it blocks uh, a cytokine or a protein called interleukin-15, which has many different purposes in the body, one of which within the intestinal tract is to recruit uh, inflammatory cells in, called intraepithelial lymphocytes to the lining of the mucosa. And so all these different uh, uh, mechanisms by which uh, we know that celiac disease develops are potential targets for diseases, uh, for, for disease intervention for celiac disease. So for the last bit of the talk, what I'd like to do now is focus uh, on what Prevention Bio is doing and how we view uh, immune-mediated diseases. So Prevention Bio is focused on both the prevention and interception of autoimmune diseases, uh, not just celiac disease, but several other autoimmune diseases. And the goal here is really to either uh, prevent the disease by attacking the disease before it develops or intercepting the disease early on uh, to prevent further damage uh, and symptomatology of the disease. And so our paradigm at prevention is, is both focused on prevention and interception of chronic immune-mediated diseases. As I mentioned, we're focused in several different areas within autoimmune. We have a, a phase three program in type one diabetes looking at at-risk patients. So patients who uh, have, have autoantibodies uh, to, uh, to uh, type one diabetes 
in newly diagnosed patients with, uh, with type 1 diabetes, so they actually have uh, a degree of, of uh, insulin um, insufficiency and have developed the signs and symptoms of diabetes. And then finally, for uh, in prevention of type 1 diabetes through uh, the development of a novel vaccine. In addition to type 1 diabetes, we also have a program um, in lupus trying to work on uh, B cell autoimmunity. And then finally, what I'd like to do is spend the last few minutes talking about our programs in celiac disease using a molecule called PRV015, uh, which is focused on, uh, on targeting interleukin-15 in the body. So PRV015 is a fully human uh, monoclonal antibody. It's a protein uh, that's given via injection. It binds to and inhibits the functions of interleukin-15. If you recall, as I mentioned in the slides previously, interleukin-15 has several roles in the development of celiac disease, both in the innate and adaptive immune system, but primarily its role is to help uh, interleukin-15 acts to recruit uh, inflammatory cells to the intestinal tract. And so the goal of using an anti-IL-15 would to be to prevent that inflammatory cascade associated with uh, the recruitment of inflammatory cells to the intestinal tract. PRV015 has undergone clinical testing in about 250 subjects total. There have been two uh, phase one clinical trials that were done in uh, healthy volunteers and in rheumatoid arthritis patients. And then there were three phase two trials that were done in celiac disease, refractory celiac disease type two, and rheumatoid arthritis. And I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the data that we have from the phase 2A study in celiac disease. I think most importantly, what we've seen from the testing that's been done thus far is that there are no new safety signals that prevent further development of uh, anti-IL-15 in the development of celiac disease. So as I mentioned, what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes talking about our, our phase 2A study and then conclude with, with the plans for um, our, our phase 2B study. This study, which involved using um, the anti-IL-15 uh, PRV015, was looked at in a phase 2A randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study evaluating uh, the, the molecule AMG714, which is the same as PRV015, in patients with celiac disease in a gluten challenge. So to show you how the study was set up, patients, uh, in the study who volunteered, so these are patients with celiac disease who were willing to commit to a gluten challenge study, uh, entered a screening period for approximately 28 days where they had labs done to make sure that they qualified appropriately for the study. And then after that screening period, they were randomized to either receive one of two doses of study drug or placebo in a blinded fashion. So what that means is that the investigators and the patients did not know which, whether they were getting study drug at which dose or whether they were getting placebo. And then they received those therapies given every day for, uh, for uh, excuse me, received the, the, uh, the uh, study drug or placebo given every two weeks for 12 weeks. There was in that study a two week run-in period where all patients before they, they received um, uh, drug were provided with uh, placebo gluten and then after two weeks entered a gluten challenge period where they were given both study drug and that gluten challenge. And so patients continued on this for approximately uh, 10 weeks and then received their last dose. You can see here at this visit six or week 10, which approximates to day 70, and then concluded with a final visit at day 84. They did undergo two biopsies, one at the beginning of the study and one at the end of the study to look at how the drug worked uh, within the lining of the mucosa to help prevent uh, in inflammation. Overall, approximately 64 patients participated in the study, 49 of which received the, the gluten challenge. So just briefly, I'm going to show a few slides on the results of the study. Um, in, it's important to understand that in celiac trials, there are several different measures that we use to, to look at outcomes in the trial some of which are based on are what we call patient-reported outcomes. So these look at, at symptoms of celiac disease, including things like abdominal pain, loose stools and diarrhea, bloating and gas, um, headache, um, and, and uh, general malaise. And those, those are included in, in patient-reported outcomes. 
And so that's one measure by which we look at, at effects of drugs in celiac disease. There are other measures which would look at lab parameters such as TTG uh, or, uh, or, or DGP, deaminated gliadin peptide, which are laboratory measures. And then finally, we can look at inflammatory measures using biopsies within the small intestine. So on the slide here, what we're looking at are two patient reported outcomes associated with celiac disease. One is called the, the uh, celiac disease patient reported outcome or the CED Pro. And the second one on the right side of the screen is what's called the CED GRS, uh, GSRS, which look at the gastrointestinal symptom rating scale. What I wanna show you here is, is that in both cases, whether you look at the CED Pro or the CED GSRS, looking at change from week zero shown here at the bottom of the slide through week 12, that PRV015 uh, in, in both cases ameliorated symptoms of the disease. And so what you can see here are these placebo patients. Week two, remember, so for the first two weeks, they were given, uh, patients were given sham gluten challenges. And then, and then at week two, they all received gluten. And you can start to see that as, as they're given gluten, that in those patients who got placebo, that those symptoms um, increased, where patients who either received 150 milligrams or 300 milligrams of drug had less increase in drugs, uh, excuse me, in their symptoms out through week 12. And so you can see here that there are some statistical significance. So there are statistical differences between the changes from week zero to week 12 in the, the groups that received drug versus placebo. Similar result, different, different uh, outcome measure, but using the CED GRSRS. Again, you can see a similar result, which is that by week 12, that there are changes that are seen that reaches almost, it almost reaches statistical significance in the highest dose of the drug given, that 300 milligram group, compared to placebo at week 12. Looking at gluten trigger diarrhea, so this is a measure of what's called the Bristol stool form scale. So it measures stool, patients report what their stools look like, um, whether uh, type one through type seven. So type seven would be uh, what's considered um, diarrhea or, or incredibly loose stool. And type six would be mushy stool, which is also consistent with uh, a diarrhea-like stool. So this is looking at weeks with diarrhea according to the Bristol stool form scale. So with BSF, Greater, uh, greater than or equal to six. So these two types of stools, you can see that again, that there were significant differences between patients who received drug and those patients who received placebo throughout the study. And you can see the differences here in study week and then at the end of the study as well. And then finally, looking at a measure called the Physician's Global Assessment, which looks at how a patient would assess, a pa uh, how a physician would look at how a patient is doing over the course of the 12 weeks. And you can see again, that, uh, that there was a reduction uh, in disease activity as assessed by the physician in patients who received drug compared to placebo. And again, importantly in this 2A study, I think uh, not only did it show that it was efficacious, but it also showed to be safe. There were no serious adverse events. And the adverse events between people who received the drug and people who received um, placebo were very similar with the exception of injection site reactions, which was a little bit higher in the patients who received uh, the, uh, the active uh, drug versus placebo. There uh, were only two subjects who were dosed with drug who discontinued due to an adverse event, and those uh, episodes were mild and only uh, thought likely not to be related to study drug. So that 2A study gave us the confidence to move forward into a uh, planning a, two, a phase 2B study. If you recall, these 2B studies are often studies that look at not only efficacy, but look at, at dose ranging to make sure that the drug does what we think it's going to do. And so what I'd like to do now is just spend a few minutes talking about our plans for the phase 2B study that we plan to start in, in uh, places around the world, including Canada, later this year. And so this is a phase 2B randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study looking at adult patients with non-responsive celiac disease as an adjunct to, to the gluten-free diet. And so importantly, this study will not have a gluten challenge. So patients will continue on a gluten-free diet um, and will use the drug as an adjunct to that gluten-free diet. So what, is it, the, oops, what does the trial look like? So again, it's a 2B randomized. So patients will be blindly assigned to either receive uh, uh, study drug or placebo. 
in a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one randomization, which means that there'll be three doses of active drug versus uh, placebo. So you, you have a 75% chance to receive uh, active drug within this trial. We're looking at patients who have uh, who are attempted a, uh, a gluten-free diet, but are not responding to that gluten-free diet for uh, um, continuing to have symptom and evidence of, uh, of histologic damage. We're looking to enroll approximately 220 patients, and as I mentioned, across a four-arm study, so three active arms and one placebo arms. The drug will be given by subcutaneous injection, and we'll look at primary endpoints, including that uh, CED Pro that I mentioned before, as well as a variety of secondary endpoints, including inflammation, hist histology, and importantly, safety. So I'm not gonna cover all the, the um, eligibility criteria for, for the study, but some of the main ones are that we'll look for adult males and females who have non-responsive celiac disease that are between the ages of 18 and 70. Uh, we do want patients who have had biopsy-confirmed diagnosis, so a biopsy uh, before entry into the study is required to demonstrate that they do have celiac disease, and they need to have had it for at least 12 months. Um, patients in the study um, uh, should have been on a gluten-free diet for at least 12 months prior to screening, and the goal here is to find patients who, who feel that they're probably still getting some inadvertent exposure to gluten, so despite their best efforts, a gluten-free diet, continue to have signs and symptoms of celiac disease, and that that gluten-free diet has been going on for at least 12 months. We do have some um, entry criteria based on symptomatology, so we'll look at uh, the CED GSRS at screening, and then we'll look at uh, the CED Pro to make sure that the abdominal symptoms are, are sufficient enough that, uh, that patients are having uh, symptoms that would uh, merit treating with, uh, with our drug. In addition, during screening, we do want patients to have detectable levels of anti-TTG or DGP um, at study entry. And this is primarily to make sure that patients really are still being exposed to gluten. So we want patients to have detectable serum levels of, of TTG, but not levels that indicate that either they are, uh, they are not adhering uh, to a gluten-free diet or that their exposure is too high um, to, uh, to gluten in their diet. And so we'll screen for uh, TTG and DGP uh, throughout the study. And then finally, uh, we want to make sure that patients who enter the study are either positive for HLA DQ2 or, and or DQ8. And if patients have had it done, we'll use that as, as uh, uh, reference um, for study entry. For patients who have not had it done, we can screen, uh, in the, we can use it in the screening period to see, to make sure that they are DQ2 and or DQ8 positive. So I think it's important for anyone who's, who's looking to participate in a trial that they understand what may be involved in trial participation. Um, I know that there are a lot of people who are on this call who probably have participated in clinical trials, but for those who haven't, I put a few things on, on the slide here to just briefly mention um, so that when you, when you go for consideration for a trial that you understand what's involved. The first and most important thing is, is that patients are understand the trial and sign what's called informed consent. And what will happen when you sign informed consent is, is that the investigator at a local site where you would go for, uh, for screening will review the plans for the trial, discuss the risk and benefits that may be there, and then have you sign permission that you are interested in participating in the study and you understand what's gonna happen with the study. Once you sign informed consent, you'll enter a, a screening period, which typically involves lab work, so you'll go into the study uh, and have some blood drawn. You may have a physical exam associated with that screening period. Um, and additionally, um, fill out some paperwork that talks about the signs and symptoms that you're experiencing associated with your celiac disease. If you qualify for the, for the, uh, the trial based on that screening period and the, and the screening labs that are done, you'll then enter a, a study period where you're randomized, again, to receive either placebo or, or uh, a dose of drug and uh, enter what's called the randomization or study period where you're, you're going through, uh, again, either receipt of study drug or placebo and filling out uh, weekly and or daily diaries to track how your symptoms are doing. During that time, you may also undergo lab work. You may undergo um, upper endoscopy biopsy. And then 
on multiple occasions, you'll have safety checks to, to make sure that, that you're doing well and that, that there aren't significant adverse events that you're experiencing associated with participation in the trial. Once you complete that study period and you have your final visit that looks at efficacy, oftentimes there's a safety follow-up period that can, can occur after that, that uh, uh, study period that looks to make sure that you're still doing well following the end of the trial. And so that typically can be anywhere from four to 12 weeks, can be longer than that in certain trials that look at, at, the, at, at how you're doing and make sure that, you've, uh, that you're continuing to do well after exposure to either placebo or that drug. And so these are the things that you may encounter when you sign up to participate in a trial. So what I want to do now is just, just spend the, the last uh, slide just summing up what we've talked about and, and why uh, we think that, that, that there's um, not only uh, uh, the importance of participating in clinical trials, but why we think that, that there's opportunity for the development of therapeutics in the, in the short term. And I, I think, you know, as, as I've focused on, that there are multiple shots on goal between a variety of different companies who are looking to develop medications for celiac disease and refractory celiac disease. And if you just look at the difference between the, the, the uh, potential therapies that were under study from 2010 to 2020, there's been a several fold increase in the interest in developing therapies for celiac disease. I think that that's due not only to, uh, to the realization that patients are requesting therapies for celiac disease in addition to a gluten-free diet, but, but that there is the real potential to, to intercede in the disease and make a difference along several different pathways within the disease that may be effective therapeutic options to intervene in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a therapeutic way. Um, hopefully, I've also convinced you that, that clinical trials are feasible and that with and without a gluten challenge. So as I mentioned, oftentimes when, when you're initially testing the, the, the drug, it may be necessary to do a gluten challenge, but as the therapy uh, demonstrates some efficacy and we move forward, the goal would be to move away from gluten challenges as the be all end all for clinical trials. And so our hope is that when we do this 2B trials I mentioned that we will not use the gluten challenge and that you can continue to, to stay on a gluten-free diet throughout uh, the study. I'd finally like to close just by thanking those people uh, who have participated in clinical trials, whether it's a celiac trial or other clinical trials, because without you, it's impossible to develop therapies uh, for, uh, uh, for novel uh, disease uh, interventions. And so you can see here that within celiac disease, about 3,000 patients have participated in, in investigational medication trials worldwide, and that we need volunteers to, who are willing to participate um, in order to continue to develop these therapies. And so I want to thank not only the patients who have participated, but support groups like the CCA who offer the opportunity for us to come talk to you about the potential for participating in clinical trials and are willing to, uh, to consider um, uh, alternative therapies and, and uses of medications uh, within in the, the scope of celiac disease that may intervene uh, and, and help uh, patients who are looking for things besides a gluten-free diet. With that, I'll, I'll conclude. And again, I want to thank everybody who makes research possible because it's without, without you guys, we can't do it. And I look forward um, to hopefully um, to having you uh, interested in participating in our trial again, which will open later this year. All right. Thanks, With Doug. that, I'll conclude. Yep, sure. Thank you. Uh, a lot of uh, cause for optimism there. We thank you as well for, you know, you kept thanking us for being participants, but thank you for being part of the solution uh, to, uh, to celiac disease. Uh, before we get to the Q&A, we're just going to uh, do our fourth poll. So it'll be popping up on your screen, hopefully. What symptoms do you get when you are accidentally glutened? And this is uh, select all that apply. And if you don't get symptoms, there's an option for you at the bottom there. Okay, we'll see what the results were. Okay, a full 75% of us get gastrointestinal problems. I'm, I'm with you on that, definitely. 
but a lot of the uh, we talked about the neurological manifestations like migraines, brain fog, disorientation. You see uh, those uh, combined uh, a lot of our, uh, our audience too. Extreme fatigue, diarrhea, twenty percent getting vomiting. Only eleven uh, percent are not uh, not getting uh, overt symptoms. Mm. A lot of classical celiacs out there. <laughs> Thanks uh, for that, uh, for your participation, and uh, we'll give uh, some uh, some questions for uh, for Doug. Uh, so, Doug, you had uh, mentioned, uh, I think, and uh, insinuated that you guessed that a lot of uh, our audience has participated in a clinical trial, but just based on my awareness of our audience, probably the vast majority have not, uh, largely because uh, there's not as many available to us in Canada. Do, do you happen to know if there are any current trials or any any recruitment going on in Canada? now in which we can participate, any recommendations? Yeah, so, so thanks for the question, Mark. So um, a couple things. So right now, you know, I showed you that slide that has uh, the ongoing trials and, and I have to confess a couple things about that slide. Obviously it's a very busy slide. Um, the, the goal really was to talk more about the, the, the strategies rather than the particular compounds. As a, as a representative of a single company, I don't think it's fair for me to weigh in a whole lot on um, other companies' therapies. So it was really to provide an overview. With that said, unfortunately, I'm not aware of, um, of current clinical trials that are available in Canada for any of the therapies that are on that screen. Now, again, I, I wanna, I know that the, the chat room is probably gonna light up and people will tell me that there are this, that company or that company. So there may be small pockets where it is available. The one, the one company that I wanted to, that, that I mentioned briefly was the company that's working on the racetide acetate. The good news about that molecule is that it's in phase three. So it's the first drug that's being developed for celiac disease that actually entered phase three. The, um, the bad news is that the trial currently, as I know it, is only active uh, in the U.S. So there is no opportunity to participate in that trial in Canada. I'm looking at the screen and I see that uh, there is a comment that, in, that there is a trial with AGY um, that is – is uh, is currently available in Edmonton. So I knew that that would happen. As I told you, I'm, I'm not up to date completely on all the potential therapies that are out there. Um, I, I do want to stress that that our goal, um, as I mentioned, is to have our trial up and going in the second half of 2020 in Canada. We're currently uh, working with several sites. I don't want to go into the, the sites right now. I don't think that's fair to, to put the sites on the spot. But that, suffice it to say that we're looking across Canada for the possibility to launch our trial in several sites across Canada. So that will be an opportunity for patients within Canada to participate in. And I, 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 Mark, I do wanna um, also say that I, if, if I did imply that, that a lot of the patients on the call um, have participated, that, that may be wrong. What I want, meant to say was that we do appreciate anyone who's participated and those who have had the opportunity to participate um, would understand some of the, the terms that are on that slide. So thanks for that. That's, a, that's an important point to point out. Thank you. All right, thank you. You had talked earlier on about blocking IL-15. Uh, so someone's wondering if there's any concerns about it being blocked in a patient that's then exposed to something that that was designed to be in the body for, like fighting cancer. What would be your comment on that? Yeah, so, so certainly, you know, with any drug that, that's developed for celiac disease, you always want to make sure that, that there aren't side effects that you didn't expect. Um, there, there's a lot of experience with the use of biologics. Anti-IL-15, the drug that we're studying, is certainly in that category of a biologic. So it's a protein that acts in the body um, that, that we know that, that act on, on, on proteins that lead to inflammation. So certainly we will monitor uh, patients closely for the development of any, any cancers. Um, there are other biologics out there, things like anti-TNF, anti-tumor necrosis factor, which are used in other autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis, um, which, which also require uh, close surveillance for things like cancer. So we're always cognizant of the fact that using um, the, these, these antibodies can lead to, um, to side effects that we need to make sure that, that, that we monitor for. Fortunately, in the trials that we've done so far using the anti-IL-15 molecule, we haven't seen any side effects like cancer um, that, that would cause significant concern, but we, we, we certainly need to stay vigilant as we move forward. Yeah. This is kind of related. Are, are any of the therapies you're talking about immunomodulating in nature, and does it mean that people treated with them would be considered immunocompromised? So, yeah. So, in general, yes, that, that's, that's true. Um, so, we, we always, in, in trials where we're doing, um, where we're using immunomodulatory, so things that, that modulate the immune system, immune system, hence the term immunomodulatory, 
they, they would be considered immune compromised. So we always take precautions like warning them about the risk of, of opportunistic infections, which sometimes occur in patients um, who are immune compromised. We would certainly uh, want to make sure that they're screened for things like tuberculosis because not necessarily with IL-15, but with other um, biologics or, or, or um, immune modulators, those can can lead to uh, risk for either reactivation of tuberculosis in patients who have latent TB or in patients who, uh, who are at higher risk to develop tuberculosis. So we always monitor patients for those opportunistic infections when they participate in these trials. For the studies uh, you've talked about, is the intent, like is the intent of the drug, like is it always that the person's on the drug all the time or are there some where you just are taking it when you're eating a food that might contain gluten? Yeah, so, so there's a variety of different options. I mean, you know, the, our drug would be taken, you know, every couple of weeks. Uh, it, it, that's the plan right now. Maybe spaced out longer than that as we move forward. But, you know, so, and then there are other therapies that, that, that maybe need, that you need to take with every meal. So things like the, the, um, the glutenases or the proteins that, that, that you would take to help digest um, uh, gluten into, into, into non-stimulatory compounds, those may be taken with every, every meal that, that you have. So there's a variety of different ways to approach it. And there's, I, I think it's, a not, it's not gonna be a one size fits all. So depending on what the molecule does, depending on what you want it to do within the body, um, you may need to take it with every, every meal or, or you may be able to take it you know, once a month or, or, or whatever the case may be, but, but, but it will not be a single solution for every, for every molecule that's being developed. I figured the answer would be, it depends. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think this will be our, our last question and one that we're all thinking of. Uh, lots of therapies being discussed, but do you think we'll ever find a cure for celiac disease? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. So um, I, I don't want to say never um, because, you know, I think that we're doing some unbelievable work. Um, you know, I, I will say that if you, if you go back to um, – to, to the slide that I showed you about our goals at prevention, um, uh, at prevention bio. And again, I'm not saying that, that we're going to necessarily cure celiac because I definitely am not saying that, but our goal is to develop not only drugs that we can use to intercept the disease. So after you've already had it, but also to prevent the disease. And so there are novel ways to approach that, that, that maybe, um, you know, down the road that we may be able to prevent celiac disease from ever forming. So we find the patients that are, are genetically predisposed and we can intervene in some way so that they are uh, no longer at risk to develop the disease. So that would be um, a, a goal, not just of ours, but of, you know, of any company that, that, that would get into it. Um, but you know, it, it's hard to tell you certainly that, 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 that there's a, there's a de definitive path for the prevention of celiac disease or the cure for celiac disease at this point. All right, well, we're all hopeful. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Uh,